before getting started, I also just wanted to acknowledge that we're, you know, in a moment in this country uh, and in other ways around the world where anti-Asian and Asian American violence continues to be um, uh, an issue at the forefront of many of our minds uh, and uh, for and many people's direct experiences. And it's something that uh, uh, concerns me greatly and that I am thinking about a lot as I listen to uh, and respond to the stories that, that I hear from friends and colleagues um, from Nepal and Tibet, uh, but also from colleagues uh, from other uh, uh, backgrounds here at Dartmouth, even and in the Upper Valley where I live. Um, and of course, New York is a very, you know, it's a sanctuary city after all. Um, and it's a place where many, many people are welcome. And yet, of course, I know, uh, and many of you know better than me that, that that doesn't mean that um, violence and aggression um, aren't occurring all the time there as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge that at the start. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And um, I choose uh, usually when I do these Zoom talks to not do the sort of full presentation mode uh, with um, with PowerPoint, but to, to keep it looking like this so that I can actually see uh, some human beings and see my notes. So I hope that you'll bear with me in using, uh, in using that format. Um, so the, the painting that you see here um, in the start of the presentation uh, is a painting that is on the cover of the book. Uh, it's a painting done by my dear friend and colleague Tenzin Norbu, uh, a painter from just west of Mustang in Nepal, a uh, region called Dolpo, which uh, some of you are from and many of you know about. Um, and I just call attention to this painting first to say that um, this entire book uh, is really the result of many, many years, 27 to be precise, of, of friendship uh, and collaboration, including with um, artists and scholars like Norbu. Um, at the start of this book, I talk about the four core relationships without which this, this text would not come to be. Um, and that's uh, a way also of acknowledging um, the fact that although this is, you know, a single authored text in, in many ways, it's also very much emergent from collaborative efforts and collaborative work. And uh, toward the end of the talk today, I'm going to talk more about that, specifically with respect to um, the Himalayan and Tibetan New Yorker experiences of and responses to COVID-19. Um, I'm going to throw into the chat a couple of resources also before I uh, go further. Um, one of which is uh, a website that I've created for this book, um, specifically geared toward teaching. Um, and geared toward the idea that although the story of Mustang is a story of a relatively small, and I'll put this in quotes, you know, out of the way place uh, in, in a small country in Asia, this is also a story that speaks to many different kinds of uh, immigration, migration, and diaspora experiences. And I've thought about um, audiences of students um, a, a lot as I, as I wrote this book. So um, this site, uh, has a visual glossary, it has writing prompts, it has other things that, that might help uh, you or um, students that you might interact with to, um, to make the most of the book if you choose to read it. And then finally, uh, uh, I just uh, am giving you into the chat a, a discount code in case any of you would like to buy the book from the University of Washington Press, this gives you 30% off. So now I'm done my spiel. Um, this book is dedicated to the late King of Lo, uh, or the Gelpo of Lo, Jigme Dorji Palwar Bista, um, who is a, was a remarkable man uh, who led his people through um, massive transitions in the 20th and uh, early parts of the 21st century. Um, and this is a book that's also very much about the ways that people like uh, the Gelpo, or in Nepali, the Raja of Mustang, have navigated these sorts of changes um, over the course of their lives. Uh, it's also a book in which I endeavor to take very seriously and to think with and to honor uh, Tibetan and Himalayan concepts, uh, ways of knowing and ways of being in the world uh, as an effort toward theory building and anthropology. Um, and this is something that perhaps we can talk more about in the Q&A. 
As I mentioned, this book emerges from 27 years of friendship and relationship and research with people from Mustang. Um, and it's included work, uh, field work done both in New York City and in Nepal, uh, including research on women's reproductive histories uh, and Tibetan adaptations to altitude, education and its relationship to outmigration, um, practices of everyday religion, both in Nepal and in New York, uh, and issues related to being and belonging. I have tried uh, in various ways to weave in some of the work I've done over the years with Tibetan doctors um, and uh, certainly Himalayan conceptions of health and illness um, and environment into the text. And uh, the work that I've done collaboratively with uh, other linguists and community members as part of the Voices of the Himalaya Project, as well as ongoing work with COVID-19, all very much inform this text. So to start off, and some of you will recognize a picture like this. Uh, this is a picture taken by Thomas Kelly, uh, a friend and colleague who spent many, many years more than me uh, in, in Nepal uh, and Tibet. Uh, this is a picture of Lomantang, uh, essentially the capital. Uh, of Upper Mustang uh, in Nepal. And I'll show you a map or several maps in a moment, but just to sort of orient um, you as an audience to where the story at some level begins. Um, Mustang is located in the Himalayan rain shadow in between the Dalagiri, uh, Dalagiri and the Annapurna Massif. The Kaligandaki River runs as a conduit through Mustang. Um, and it's been a location of cultural and economic exchange for many centuries. Uh, Mustang is a space that is home to uh, Buddhism uh, as well as Bon. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a place that, again, straddles in so many ways um, multiple nation states, multiple histories, um, and multiple ways of being in the world. Uh, the Kingdom of Lo emerged essentially in the uh, late for, uh, 14th century, early 15th century, and is connected to the, um, uh, the Western Tibetan kingdoms of Gungtang. Um, it was incorporated into the nation state of Nepal during that nation state's essential formation uh, in the mid to late 18th century. And of course, Mustang has also been a very important place and if you will, a player in the story uh, or many stories of, of the annexation of Tibet by China, uh, in 1959, um, the experience and, and movements of Tibetans into exile, and also efforts uh, at retaining or winning back different forms of Tibetan sovereignty. Mustang was the base of operations from 1960 to 1974 of the uh, Tibetan Resistance Army, or the Kampas, as they're sometimes known, uh, backed uh, for a number of those years by the American CIA. Um, and again, I'm sure that many of you are aware of this, he this history. Suffice it to say that Mustang um, has been and remains a very important and sensitive border region uh, for a number of different uh, reasons and, and dynamics. Um, and those reasons and dynamics continue to get more complex today. This is a picture taken uh, at sunrise in Lamantang along the Kora route or the circumambulation route around the walled city. Um, it was taken the last time I was there uh, in the summer of 2019. Um, and it's a way also of holding the memories that I have of the Logyalpo or the King of Mustang um, and his sense of what it means to be of and from and to steward this place. I, I hold very dearly the memories that I have of uh, uh, watching and at certain moments participating in these early morning choras uh, with the king um, and, uh, and got a chance also even in this last trip in 2019 to watch um, his adopted son and heir, uh, now essentially the king of Mustang, the man many people know as Gyalsung, um, uh, do this same route. And when the king was dying, a Nepali media report came out um, that his last words to his family were never migrate from the village or the district. Now, of course, uh, I can't precisely confirm the veracity of this statement, but I do believe in its essence. The late king loved his home fiercely with his whole being. 
Even so, his dying wish is a promise that um, is impossible to keep. And this is in part what this book tries to unravel and to do some justice to. Uh, people from Mustang have been moving uh, far before they started to come to New York. Cycles of movement and mobility have been part of what it means to be from Mustang for decades, if not centuries. And this challenges the idea that somehow Mustang is a remote or only remote and out of the way place. Rather, it's a village or a set of villages in the world and a place where the world is reflected in each village. It's a place that sees a lot of dynamic uh, seasonal trade, um, also movement for animal husbandry and agriculture, wage labor migration to uh, North India, to other cosmopolitan parts of Asia have gone on for, for many, many years, for many decades. Um, and so there has been a flow back and forth in and through Mustang for a long time. Tourism began uh, in earnest in Upper Mustang in 1992 after the region was open to foreign travelers, but the lower part of the district has been a key part of the Annapurna trekking circuit um, since the late 70s. Uh, and it's a place, again, where, uh, as you can sort of see in this image here, tradition and modernity coalesce in very interesting ways. You have horses next to motorcycles beside Jeeps. Um, and in this image uh, on the right, which is a, uh, a painting done by the really wonderful Nepali artist Bidata KC, um, it's a place where Lavaza Coffee, Coffee and the Mona Lisa Guest House and Yak Donald's merge and meld into Tibetan scripture and deep, deep histories of uh, early Tibetan inhabitants of the plateau uh, and of the early strands of Buddhism uh, moving through Tibetan and Himalayan worlds. Um, the next picture will be familiar to those of you, very familiar to those of you who are uh, here in New York today. Um, and this is a way of talking about the fact that the place where many people from Mustang have ended up is um, a hyper diverse region of a hyper diverse uh, city um, where many, many ethnicities, histories, diasporas interact with each other. For those of you not familiar with this picture, this is um, the seven train uh, tracks above uh, Roosevelt Avenue uh, in Jackson Heights. Um, and the insert is uh, a little map that was drawn um, actually by someone who, who owned the, uh, the Airbnb where I stayed for a lot of New York based fieldwork in Queens. And I just uh, always love this image of, of sort of the, the, the neighborhoods uh, uh, existing uh, beside each other, you know, Korea next to Tibet, next to Nepal, next to Colombia. Notice it's spelled like the university, not the country. Um, and uh, the image here with spicy Tibet next to a Colombian bakery down the street from a Bangladeshi bodega. Um, and so just to pause and to consider, you know, that first picture of Mustang, that first picture of Lomantang and this picture and to imagine um, as many of you uh, know much better than me and have experienced you, yourselves, the kind of uh, radical shifts of affect, of daily life, of the sights and sounds and smell of exist smells of existence that mark migration from a place like Mustang to a place like New York City. Just to give you briefly uh, a map or a set of, of maps to, to work with here in case you're not familiar with this part of the world. Um, both, of these, uh, both of these maps are, uh, are in the book. Um, the one on the left is a map of Mustang with an inset of uh, the country of Nepal sort of showing where Mustang sits in relation to the rest of the country. Um, and the map on the right emerges from uh, some of this collaborative work I've done uh, with the Endangered Language Alliance and uh, based in New York City and a number of other uh, uh, community collaborators that, that shows sort of side by side, uh, on the one hand, the different parts of Mustang, uh, and on the other hand, the different parts of what um, uh, I will refer to as Himalayan and Tibetan New York City. Uh, and of course, both of these maps in many ways are uh, in some senses fixed and on the other hand, continuing to transform. Um, 
So at the heart of this book are, are essentially two different uh, concepts, two different ways of making sense of and thinking about the world that come uh, from the Tibetan language and from Tibetan and Buddhist philosophy and orientations to the world. The first uh, on the top here uh, is Korwa, and the second is Kora. So for those of you uh, who are unfamiliar with Tibetan or with these concepts, essentially uh, Kora is uh, circumambulation. It's what people do around the sacred sites such as Boda or Swayambunat in, uh, in Kathmandu uh, at the beginning and the ends of the day. It's a mode of ritual enactment, but it's also a way of being in the world that is coupled, coupling prayer with conversation um, and with a sense of uh, patterned reflection in how people live their lives. And it's also very much built around this idea um, that we live our lives in circles and in cycles. Korwa refers uh, to what in Sanskrit is, is known as samsara, basically the paths of birth, aging, sickness, death, and rebirth through which we as sentient beings move. Um, and so I've thought a lot about these two concepts in the, in the thinking and the writing of this book, um, in great part because these are both concepts that are really important to the people that I know and have learned from over many years of going to Mustang and interacting with people from Mustang and other parts of the Tibetan and Himalayan world. And so imperfectly in English uh, or in an English gloss, I should say, I've chosen in this book to talk about what I call the Kora of migration. Um, and this again is a, is a way to think about the relationship between these two Tibetan concepts as they inform cycles of mobility and migration in and around and between the worlds of Nepal and New York. Kora in this sense, and this is of course a picture of Boda in Kathmandu and people doing Kora at the end of the day, Kora marks the many discrete lives that can exist within one human life. Uh, it's a reckoning symbolized by a wheel of time, of life, of Buddhist teachings, but also a turning of that wheel in specific locations. And I've come really to, to see migration as a form of Kora. Uh, and in fact, as my friend and colleague, Carol McGranahan says, you know, anthropology in many ways and the, the, the dynamics of anthropological fieldwork are themselves a form of Kora. Um, but uh, I have used these terms basically to help me think about patterns of movement, dynamics of world making and attendant experiences of loss and wonder that shape migration and social change in and through Mustang. Uh, and I've done this you know, in great part because, uh, well, for, for many different reasons. First is again, taking seriously Tibetan and Himalayan concepts. Second is to recognize that although um, sometimes we like to view diaspora um, as a, uh, as what, it, what the etymology of the word comes from, as this sense of dispersal, a casting out and a casting across and a transformation of a way of life. Um, dispersal, however, isn't uniform and dispersals don't necessarily run in straight lines. Um, as anybody who's part of a diaspora knows deeply, um, diaspora figures in circles and in cycles. Um, and so again, I find these concepts useful to think with. I think also um, the concept of Kora as I'm trying to use it in this book um, does something different or adds to conversations that we, we might have in anthropology or allied disciplines around terms like globalization, transnationalism and the worlding of people, ideas and things. So you could think about it this way. If globalization is a gloss for circulation of resources and neoliberal ideas, and transnationalism emphasizes the dissolution of geopolitical boundaries and worlding troubles assumptions about how or in what directions global movements occur, um, we have a good basis. But I would argue that onto the bones of these intellectual ideas, Kora adds a layer of muscle memory of cyclic movement, of ethical action, and of a walking temporality that links the past and the present to possible futures in many different parts of the world. The other 
concept, if you will, that guides this book is the title itself. Um, and, uh, and the ways that these patterns of migration and movement, the Cora of migration, if you will, is linked to and rooted in relatedness, in kinship. Um, as many of us know deeply, migration at once depends on and works on kinship. We follow the paths and the footsteps of those who have come before us and who have moved before us. And people call upon kinship networks to both facilitate the logistics of migration, visas, jobs, apartments, but also to help each other through the less visible but equally challenging emotional transitions that this involves. Um, and I would just say that no matter where people from Mustang find themselves, the social obligations that anchor kinship mean that really one's first effort in almost any situation is to establish, often through the recitation of lineage or place-based history, um, family connections, through a telling of names and places, where and how you fit within this circle. In Himalayan communities, as is elsewhere, webs of relatedness keep people at once beholden to each other and endeared to each other. I think this says something about love and understanding and about home. And so the ends is not at all an end. Um, it is multiple. It is not singular. Um, and it speaks to the ways that people from Mosang so creatively and with so much dynamism and, uh, and uh, care really continue to try to remake and retie their connections to each other. And they do that, of course, through very complex circumstances. This is a picture that in a sense illustrates some of what I mean by the ends of kinship. The picture on the left is a picture that hangs above one of the daycares um, in a village in Mustang. And the picture on the right is part of what the, the, the quota of migration and the ends of kinship mean in real time for real people. This is a grandmother caring for a grandchild uh, whose parents are in New York. Um, and again, this is part of uh, the way that I think about the ends of kinship. None of this is stagnant. That child will eventually return to New York and go to school in New York um, and have the connection to their grand grandparents from these early days. And yes, of, and yet, of course, looking at this picture, you know that this isn't easy. There is a lot of sacrifice involved on many different levels um, in making the quota of migration possible. This again might be an illustration that's familiar to many of you who are in New York or familiar with Himalayan and Tibetan New York. This is the Sherpa Gumpa on 75th Street in Jackson Heights. And it's a meeting of the Himalayan Elders Project. And again, this is a way of saying that the ends of kinship also uh, concern everything from the beginning to the ends of life and the ways that people are making home and making uh, transitions and caring for each other, abiding with each other through these forms of movement, including uh, elders from Mustang who've spent most of their lives elsewhere, finding themselves at the end of their lives in a very different space and place in New York City. This is a picture of one of my uh, core collaborators, um, uh, dear friends and key relationships, uh, Nawang Tsiring. Um, uh, and this is a picture of him with me in Mustang in 2014 while we were doing field work together. Um, uh, Nawang lives and works in New York, but it's a, it's a picture that illustrates again, some of the dynamics of loss and wonder and complexity involved in the ends of kinship and the quota of migration. Um, for those of you, again, who uh, speak and read Tibetan and who know the Tibetan exile context, you'll recognize this idea of lokro or return as meaning one very uh, specific political thing. In other words, it's referencing the possibility of a return of Tibetans to Tibet. And yet this Tibetan term on this person, on this t-shirt, in this place, begins to mean something uh, in addition to that, uh, and also something else. Um, questions of return hang heavy in the lives and the minds of many people from Mustang, including those who still live in Mustang or who live in Kathmandu, as well as those who live their lives primarily in New York City. Um, there are many questions, and the book explores these dynamics of when and how and under what circumstances people 
uh, from one uh, part of the world who have man maybe perhaps then made their lives in another part of the world we're con will continue to uh, have uh, and maintain connections to both places over time and across generations. I've written this book in part by reading a lot of anthropology, um, but also in part by reading a lot of literature and letting it seep in and, and soak in to me. Um, one of my heroes uh, in this regard uh, and someone whose work I absolutely love and really benefit from is the poet and essayist and author Sitting Wang Modompa, who many of you probably know. But I've also turned toward the stories of other exiles, other diasporas, including writers like Teju Cole, who writes about being Nigerian and Nigerian American, and also about what all that means in New York City, as well as to poets uh, like Mary Oliver, who speaks to um, what I might call elements of a universal humanity about how to find oneself uh, in the world. And all of these things have helped me, again, make further sense of and hopefully do some sort of justice to the stories that I, with which I've been entrusted over these many years uh, with people uh, and, and by people from Mustang. I mentioned at the outset that this book combines short fiction and narrative ethnography. Um, the work uh, of both inform how I tell the stories of kinship, migration, care, and belonging. Uh, just as literature has provided me with guidance through uh, my research and writing process, I've turned to these literary approaches in my writing for a number of reasons. Um, one simple reason is that I like to write. I love to write. Uh, I knew I was going to be some form of a writer well before I knew I was going to be an anthropologist. And that has continued to inform how and why I try in my work to uh, address diverse audiences uh, with, the, with the work that I produce. But I've also, so at some level, it's a personal and, a, and an aesthetic choice. Um, but the combination of fiction and ethnography runs much deeper than that in terms of why I've done this. It's also uh, at one level an ethical choice. It's a choice about how I tell hard stories um, and how um, the, the capacity of just using a pseudonym is often not enough, I feel, um, to try to do justice again to the complexities of social reality and at the same time um, honor elements of uh, the uh, both the privacy and the internality of um, complex stories of migration. And so another way to say this is that um, as a writer, I believe that it takes imagination and sometimes the process of creating fictional worlds in order to see social truths. But as an anthropologist, I argue that fiction uh, as a method and a form reveals also the strengths of ethnographic knowing. Um, and some of its limits, specifically when it comes to letting imagination foster empathy and curiosity within and across culture. Each mode, I would argue, illuminates the other. Anthropological theory uh, and ethnographic writing enfolds specific human dramas within larger webs of meaning, but fiction shapes the stories held within data into complex sensory, affective, and dramatic experiences that speak to and beyond the specifics of culture. And so I've tried to work with these ideas as I've written this book. True to Cora, um, this book also follows from birth through different elements of life, uh, pregnancy, birth, and childhood, the work of making a living and making families, to old age, death, and forms of rebirth. Um, and uh, like my dear friend and colleague and research collaborator, Jeff Childs, in his wonderful book, Tibetan Diary, I feel that this structure actually also does a certain kind of justice in organizing all of this material in a way that, that uh, um, makes sense uh, to the people primarily for whom, or, or most, uh, most deeply for whom this book is written, and that is people from Mustang themselves. I'm going to finish just by giving you uh, a few little snippets of some of the more collaborative work that I'm engaged in right now that ties together um, very much the work of uh, this book, 
with ongoing responses to COVID. So uh, again, I don't have to tell this audience that many Himalayan and Tibetan New Yorkers were at the epicenter of the epicenter just about a year ago. And building on long-term relationships with uh, people from Mustang who I've worked with for many years, uh, as well as um, colleagues, like I've mentioned at the Endangered Language Alliance, as well as uh, linguist Mark and anthropologist Mark Turin, uh, and Maya Dorio at the University of British Columbia, we began doing some work to try to understand uh, many of the different elements uh, uh, of experiences of people living with and through the, the pandemic in Himalayan and Tibetan New York. And these are just some of the, the things that that work has touched on. Um, this issue, again, of visibility and invisibility as it plays out across dynamics of structural racism in healthcare, economic hardships, trying to make sense of this disease um, and the relationship of all of this to language, culture and frameworks for suffering and its alleviation. Part of that work has been uh, doing daily COVID diaries um, in with 10 different people in seven different languages. And here you see uh, actually Nalong's wife, wonderful wife, Dickie, who was an expectant mother uh, through, um, through the COVID pandemic. Uh, and she's one of our diarists. We also did a series of ethnographic virtual uh, remote ethnographic interviews um, to hear from Himalayan and Tibetan communities, um, not just people from Mustang, but including people from Mustang about their experiences with the pandemic. Um, and all of these languages again, uh, sorry, all of these interviews were done in different regional languages and dialects. We've connected and worked with and tried to highlight the amazing community outreach work that has been done by different community organizations, not only to try to, uh, if you will, take care of uh, their own communities, but also being there for people in the wider communities of New York City, other essential workers, for example. Uh, finally, we have connected this work on COVID to ongoing work uh, really building out of the Endangered Languages uh, Alliance's um, map and a beautiful analog map that they've produced over many years of the languages of New York City. Um, as we take that analog map and turn it into uh, a set of digital tools. And um, so this is just one example. It's sort of probably hard to see the details, but this is positive COVID-19 tests by zip code. Uh, early on in the pandemic. Um, and essentially this is a way to look at the relationship between language diversity in, in you know, intensely uh, uh, immigrant communities and neighborhoods like Elmhurst, like Jackson Heights with COVID caseloads and to think about these correlations and what they mean. But these mapping exercises are also ways of mobilizing response um, and allowing for different forms of community outreach and representation. So some of this work has even recently um, been presented by Nawang and Ross Perlin, one of the Endangered Language Alliance collaborators at a big uh, sort of COVID related town hall uh, around um, uh, ongoing COVID response sponsored by the New York uh, City Health Department. Um, and that work again is ongoing. I've also had the great good fortune. Uh, oh, and actually here um, we just had today, uh, I'm throwing this into the chat, um, an op-ed published in the Globe and Mail uh, uh, Canadian newspaper on the unequal effects of COVID-19 on multilingual immigrant communities. So that work is ongoing. Finally, I've been really fortunate to work with um, a couple of people uh, uh, younger scholars than me who are also both uh, invested in Mustang, Tashi Gurung, who himself is uh, a grad student at Arizona State University and from Lomantang, and Emily Ombergi, who is a student at UBC um, and who is doing her collaborative dissertation research in Mustang and also to a certain extent in New York, both of them working on issues related to uh, environmental change in Mustang, uh, migration, tourism, and other forms of social change. And so we've been working collectively uh, on an article that hopefully will be forthcoming soon from development and change on some of the ways that uh, the COVID moment has um, unearthed, uh, recast, uh, 
um, challenge different kinds of assumptions upon which migration from places like Mustang to New York have rested. Assumptions, for instance, that in America, to use a Nepali phrase, system talk, you know, there, there is a system that's going to catch you um, in, in moments of adversity. Um, COVID has challenged that in various ways. And it's also brought to the fore the importance of systems that exist within immigrant communities themselves. Systems, for instance, of the Kiduk organizations, uh, whose, uh, whose shingles you see here, uh, again in Queens. Another assumption that remittances are and will be reliable and that they will continue to help make life better for those uh, in home communities such as Nepal. A third assumption also being that reinvesting in a place like Mustang in its tourism industry, for instance, is, is a profitable and worthwhile thing. For all sorts of reasons, COVID has opened up questions about whether or not or how these assumptions actually will continue to bear out in practice. And so uh, I leave you with this and I'll, I'll stop and um, really welcome questions and conversations uh, based both on uh, the ends of kinship work, um, but also with the, uh, the other things that I've just shared with you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Sienna, for your talk. This was um, really amazing to hear your work and also um, both uh, past and current. Um, if there are any questions um, that people want to ask, you can post them in the chat box and um, uh, and either you can you can ask it yourself or you can ask or I can um, ask it on your behalf. And while we wait for questions, um, I can just start off. Um, so um, since since you kind of begin and end your talk on um, the impacts of the pandemic um, on and, and also um, just, you know, um, also the uh, well, well, let's start with the pandemic, um, the impacts of the pandemic on um, the Himalayan communities, um, especially in New York. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, your work in that aspect, um, especially how for instance, um, these kinship ties or community ties and um, different subjectivities have shaped the ways that Mustangi or Himalayan communities more broadly in New York have responded to the social, economic and healthcare crises that the pandemic has, you know, kind of uh, intensified. Sure, uh, Evelyn, thanks for that question. And in a sense, I can, I can link that to the question that Jan uh, asked in the chat about the role of Amshi in the COVID situation, um, because that's a, piece of, that's a piece of the response. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the uh, impacts of COVID uh, in, in both places in different ways have been uh, intense and sustained. Um, and um, be that in the form of uh, sickness uh, as well as loss of life. Um, people from Mustang have died of COVID, did die of COVID, um, including people I know well. Um, and uh, at the same time, there's been a really amazing um, set of community responses and organizations. Um, uh, as I mentioned a bit, you know, this is included forms of the delivery of um, uh, personal protective equipment to, to households, the delivery of a lot of food to a lot of different people. Um, but also, again, this really important work around language and translation. Um, and this, again, is not unique to or only about Mustang. Um, you know, the, the Tibetan uh, Nurses Association of, uh, of New York and New Jersey has been uh, amazing in their responses. Uh, many people, including those connected to the New York Tibetan Service Center, have created, especially early on in the uh, pandemic, phone trees uh, and ways of making sure that people had different forms of information about um, pandemic response, but also just about what COVID is and was and how it manifests and what to do about it. Um, one of the diaries, again, not a Mustang example, but um, an example connected to Columbia in the sense that uh, the, the diarist is someone who teaches uh, at Columbia as well, Kuncho Tseten, La, um, uh, you know, he's a Tibetan physician um, who practices in New York and 
Um, his work, uh, as is documented in the diaries, is a really wonderful illustration of the ways that Tibetan medicine um, has continued to figure into Tibetan and Himalayan, um, not curing of, of COVID, but of response to um, this disease at multiple levels, not, not only perhaps to, for those who, who contracted COVID and were suffering from its symptoms, but also, and in addition, um, other forms of uh, suffering and illness, uh, both mental and physical, uh, that have resulted from the pandemic. Um, and uh, there are analogs uh, back in, in Kathmandu and in Mustang, of course, as well. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Evelyn, or, or should I? Yeah, okay. And I guess just to kind of um, kind of uh, go back to what you mentioned at the beginning of your talk about um, kind of the responses of uh, these communities to the the anti Asian violence that mm -hmm. has been occurring, especially in the last year and um, that we've seen in the last week, especially. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a, a little bit about how the response has been in Himalayan communities in the US? Has it kind of made people reconsider um, their relative invisibility in the US? That's a really interesting question. And I would, you know, I would invite many others who are on this call to participate in the answer. Um, you know, but what I can say is that, um, you know, one of the forms of, of invisibility that occurs is, is misrecognition. In other words, people from Himalayan or Tibetan communities, you know, and I write about this a bit in the book, either being um, misrecognized as um, Mexican, which of course is this big, you know, swath of things that is not just that, um, and being targets of, of forms of racist language or violence um, because of that misrecognition, but also, you know, again, being seen as um, uh, Chinese um, or, you know, otherwise um, targeted or misrecognized um, and at the same time still rendered invisible. So I definitely think that uh, again, many many on this Zoom call are are um, better positioned to answer that question than me. But I just can say that I've borne witness to it. I've heard about it, um, and that uh, there have been and in our corpus of materials, um, the diaries as well as the interviews, there are um, there is mention of that and mention of responses to that. So different um, Nepali and Himalayan Tibetan activists talking about. Uh, ways to respond to this. And uh, again, kind of linking uh, in and around these questions of belonging and identity, how you sort of sit with, you know, both with uh, an identity that would um, be framed around Himalayanness or Tibetanness or Nepaliness, um, but also around what it means to be Asian or Asian American, or to even more broadly be a person of color at this particular point in the US uh, or in New York. And so I think that, you know, part of what's both you know, deeply interesting, also disturbing, also important to pay attention to is sort of how, how that works um, in and for people from this part of the world living in the States. Thank you. Um, yeah, it really highlights um, different precarities and vulnerabilities of um, being in the US at this moment. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to kind of zoom back out to um, to to think about your your book, The Ends of Kinship. Um, so in, in in many ways, this book is the culmination of decades of not only your research but the relationships that you've you've built um, across time and space with people who become what you call your family by choice. And um, so as like an experienced academic and a creative writer, you bring together, as you also, you talked about the creative short stories and um, ethnographic pieces um, in a very purposefully fragmented manner to kind of replicate and reflect the complex patterns of stitching together lives um, between Nepal and New York. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how you came to conceive of this um, as a book project mm -hmm. and um, who was the audience or audiences that you had in mind when you were writing this? 
Thanks for that question, Evelyn. Um, I appreciate it. Yes, um, you know, fragmented and and complex is is right, um, but also you know sustained and sincere. And um, you know, I, I think that I began to conceive of this book as a book in earnest, um, uh, probably in about 2014. Um, but didn't begin writing until 2018, I guess. Um, and, you know, um, I think in many ways it's taken, this isn't a book that I could have written um, or probably should have written uh, even at an earlier stage in my life and my career. Um, I think it's taken um, time, like all good ethnography, uh, I think does, to figure out um, not only what I know, but to the best of my abilities, what I don't know and where my blind spots are and how to try to, again, represent and with, with different forms of, but sustained attention to the fidelity of those relationships and those experiences. Um, and um, that again is part of why I chose this, this hybrid form of, of narrative ethnography that again reveals not only sort of who I am and where I sit, because all the narrative ethnography has a sort of first person element. You, you see, in a sense, a little bit how I'm positioned as compared to the fiction, which again is written from different points of view. Um, the stories themselves have, so themselves have more of a complete narrative arc, but of course um, they're still authored, you know, in a sense by me. And um, that was a, a, one of the ways that I tried to wrestle with this very good question that you ask, you know, how to represent both in its complexity and, its, and its, in its always um, imperfect or incomplete understanding um, what it is I feel like I've come to learn from these, from these many years of, of friendship and research. Um, and, you know, I, I chose to write the stories first and to write from memory in great part because I felt I needed to trust that. I needed to trust that process, at least to get a draft of the stories out. And then I went back through, you know, these decades of field notes and interviews and I re-listened and in some cases I retranslated and, you know, and, and I coded and I sorted and, you know, I did all of that stuff. And then after that began to draft the, the um, narrative ethnographic chapters and then went back and revised the stories and then went back and revised the narrative ethnography and then took the whole thing to Mustang in, in, uh, uh, in late 2018 and, and read pieces aloud to people from Mustang and, you know, got, got their feedback and incorporated it. So it's, you know, it's a mosaic within a mosaic in, in a sense. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's also been a very rewarding process. Your question of audience is important and I'll end with that. Um, in terms of answering your question, fundamentally, um, at, at its smallest but deepest level, I wrote this book for people uh, uh, like um, he's. I don't think he's on the call anymore, but like uh, my my friend and colleague and co-writer Tashi um, or uh, or Nalong, um, people who for whom this is their experience um, and and for whom. Um, uh, I hope that this does some form of justice to making sense of that experience um, uh, now and in the future. Um, but I've also written this book again as a, as a way to think about how to write anthropology differently um, and about how to tell stories of um, migration and diaspora in a way that can work in an academic setting, but that also um, doesn't have to be limited uh, by the academy. Thank you, Sienna. Yeah, I really love how you open up um, new ways to think about how you can write um, ethnographically. Um, and um, I, I teach a course on um, ethnographic representations and I really look forward to using your book in my class in the future. Um, Thanks. So we, the audience is being quite shy. If anyone has any questions, you can, you can please uh, post to the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, so one of the things I really appreciate about your book is your conscious move that you talk about not to adopt the theoretical framework that comes from academic discourses. And 
you know, as you say, this kind of reinforces dominant power structures of knowledge production. And instead you um, look for your theory within the communities you're working in. And um, I just wanted to, and this is an approach that um, some scholars are, are, you know, using in uh, de decolonial and indigenous studies um, mm -hmm. and increasingly more, more broadly, um, um, but maybe not as, uh, as broadly as we hope. Um, but I wonder if you could talk more about like method, how you mm. came to center on the concept of Quora, how it occurred to you that this could be a useful theorizing framework um, and just, yeah, talk through that process a little bit. Absolutely. And, and again, thanks for that really good question. I mean, so first I would say that I think um, over, uh, especially the last decade, I've, I've learned a great deal and continue to learn a great deal from um, uh, the Native and Indigenous colleagues, scholars, um, activists that um, I've had opportunities to interact with both here at Dartmouth, which has a, a really amazing Native American studies program, but also in time that I've spent in a very different part of the world in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, as part of my teaching responsibilities at Dartmouth. We lead a study abroad program there and I, and I lead it on, you know, sort of on, on rotation. And so I think that, you know, I've, I've really benefited from um, the kinds of conversations that have occurred in those spaces um, uh, around these sorts of questions of, of what theory is and where it sits and why with, you know, my, my sort of longer term connections to Himalayan and Tibetan communities. And, you know, I've always had a certain always, I mean, since I was in graduate school and you start to force, you know, square peg, round hole, real world experience into a theory that's gonna work. So you write your dissertation, you know, um, I've struggled with that, you know, and I've struggled with the ways that that seems to relegate um, really important philosophy to the space of ethnographic example, um, as opposed to actually saying, wait a minute, this is a this is a framework that may emerge from one part of the world, but is useful to think with beyond that part of the world, inclusive of and beyond that part of the world. And so, you know, I, I credit people like uh, a colleague uh, now of Sarah and Marks at U University of British Columbia, uh, Bernard Purley, who spent a couple of years at Dartmouth. Um, the uh, uh, the anthropologist and thinker Zoe Todd, um, Audra Simpson, Simpson, I mentioned, you know, some of these folks have been, and, and many colleagues in New Zealand, really formative in that thinking. Cora itself, you know, I mean, part of that just came again from the immersion into my field notes and kind of seeing how often and in how many different ways people would talk either in New York or in Nepal not only about, yes, I'm going to go out and do Quora now at the end of the day or whatever, but, but how much people missed that actual act of, of doing Quora once they were in New York and how often that came up as something that, that kind of crystallized the kind of time, space, compression, and the loss of time that occurs as you move um, from, from a place like Nepal to a place like New York, given life and work and everything else. Um, but then also this idea of sort of seeing Kora as part of Korwa and thinking about that in the context of migration, that really came, again, directly from conversations, some of which I recount in the book of dear friends basically sort of recounting to me their dream year in the cycle of a life, which would be to spend, you know, to do Kora around all these different locations in the course of a year or in the course of a lifetime, such that especially they didn't have to um, die alone in New York or die alone in Nepal. Um, and, you know, so, so that's really where the, that, all of that came from. That's really fascinating to hear just all the, the threads that kind of came together for you to um, kind of uh, find this, this framing concept for your book. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, um, so you, you work both in Nepal and then also across the Himalayas with um, Tibetan communities in, in, in 
um, in, in, on the Tibetan Plateau in China. And so this question is asking if you can talk a little bit about any parallels that you might see in terms of the social changes that are going on in Mustang and in Tibetan communities across the Himalayas, um, specifically like um, in terms of uh, the shift from subsistence economies to mm -hmm. market economy and um, out migration. It's a great question. I mean, I think that there are many, uh, many parallels and many connections, especially around um, this idea of uh, what subsistence is or means um, and how people subsist um, in, in each of these places. And um, although it's been uh, uh, more years since I've done, uh, what to say, on the ground field work in Tibetan regions of China than it has since I've been um, back doing that sort of work in Nepal, um, certainly dynamics around um, sedentarization, uh, the, the, um, uh, of, of nomads and, you know, nomadic and semi-nomadic communities on the Tibetan plateau, the dynamics around cash crops from Yartsagumbu on forward, um, uh, issues around um, the links, especially between education and patterns of migration and social change, I think have a lot of parallels um, on both sides uh, of, that, of that Himalayan Tibetan border. Um, the politics are different, obviously, at certain levels, but the net results of certain things, for instance, around language change, um, have have real parallels there. You know the the dynamics driving, let's say, uh, the child of a of a Tibetan herder from Yushu sending his child to a school where they may not be being educated in Tibetan, and the dynamics of a Mustangi parent sending their child to um, you know a boarding school in Kathmandu where they may not speak Tibetan are different, right? The framing situations are different, but um, how that works on those young people um, it does have a lot of, um, uh, of parallel there. Um, and I'm really, you know, um, both interested in and, and um, concerned uh, by or, or just, you know, noticing those kinds of, those kinds of parallels. Um, there are also then these kinds of border crossing issues that link these communities. So one thing I didn't talk much about uh, uh, today, but is an important part of the book are sort of issues around um, geopolitics on the one hand and environmental change on the other. And so, you know, right now, uranium has been discovered in Mustang. It's very, it's of, of great interest, both to ne the Nepali government and the Chinese government and in an ancillary way to the Indian government. Um, you know, a road of course now links the, the border in Mustang down to Kathmandu. Um, and uh, it's a much easier and more reliable border crossing uh, in sort of geomorphologically, uh, if not geopolitically, um, than other parts of Eastern Nepal uh, borders. Um, and, you know, colleagues like Galen Merton uh, and Sam Cohen have written a lot about that, um, Austin Mord as well. So that links also the fates of the communities on, on both sides of this, both you know, at some level arbitrary and at other levels, very important border. Thank you, Sienna. Um, we have another question. And um, so you, you, um, you answered um, a question from Jan earlier about the role of Amchi in um, the pandemic in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, this person is asking if you can go into a little bit more depth about that, the role of the Amchi in, in COVID in New York. Sure, um, and thanks for that question too. Um, we have a, a, a forthcoming article um, that, that Konstruk Setin is also a co-author on, as is Nawang and um, colleagues at the Endangered Language Alliance and at UBC. Um, they go into a lot more detail um, based on Konstruk's diaries sort of about this issue. But what I will say is that on the one hand, there has been, um, there has been a, a, a big and broad transnational or translocal response amongst Tibetan physicians to this illness. Um, and that has included new treatment protocols, um, as well as different kinds of studies that are, that are being done, um, certainly in China and also to a certain extent um, here in the US or with, with Tibetan practitioners in North America. Um, 
friend and colleague Tony Tidwell, um, uh, as, where, as well as uh, uh, Tenzin Namdal, uh, another Tibetan physician, have been working on that. Um, so one thing is to sort of track how Tibetan medicines have been helping people cope with um, with the symptoms of COVID. And, you know, um, uh, I won't speak deeply to this, but anecdotally, it's helped a lot um, and has related to also um, Chinese medical responses um, at certain levels, especially back in China. Um, but then there have also been the ways that Tibetan physicians have really been committed, uh, and Kunchok uh, Tetan is a great example of this, committed to their patients fully, um, inclusive but not limited to COVID. So many of the diary entries, you know, also talk about um, the kinds of, of uh, uh, diseases or illnesses um, or just forms of, of physical suffering that people are incurring because they're essential workers, not necessarily because their COVID uh, patients um, and continuing to respond to that. So there's one really poignant diary about um, treating taxi drivers and Uber drivers who um, have all sorts of kidney problems because of the ways that their, you know, their lives and their livelihood don't allow for them to take breaks to go to the bathroom and how that's coupled with, you know, the, the precarity that's caused to their, you know, themselves and their livelihood by COVID. Um, Kunshok also recounts a really um, moving set of stories around uh, a dear friend of his who gets a, a couple of complex diagnoses, including one for cancer, in the midst of the pandemic, and sort of how he's trying to help um, those patients navigate all of those things um, uh, in, a, in a holistic manner, not just focused on on COVID, um, but then there have also been uh, the the transference or the you know the sending of medicines back and forth across the world, um, as well as uh, uh, rimsung or you know other forms of protective amulets um, that were also very popular uh, and used a lot during, for instance, the SARS pandemic in China in 2002-3. Those have also been in circulation and and quite important to people, um, as well as the sort of marrying of uh, different forms of meditation and other kinds of Buddhist practice um, in and around responses to the stress and the mental uh, precarities of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Sienna. Um, so are there any last questions? If not, then... Um, like to thank you very much for, for joining us today, Sienna. And I highly encourage um, everyone to check out Sienna's website that she shared with us at the top of the chat and um, take advantage of the discount code that she also shared with us um, and, um, and check out her book too. And one, one thing I wanted to mention too, because it's exciting to me, is that um, we're doing a, a, a Nepal uh, printed edition of the book um, through Himal Books um, and the Social Science Baha. Uh, so it'll be available to people uh, in Nepal for about 800 rupees as opposed to $30, which I'm really happy about. So, yeah. That's amazing. Um, so thank you very much, Sienna. And, um, I really look forward to seeing your, your forthcoming work as well. Thanks so much for hosting this, Evelyn. I really appreciate it. And thanks friends on the call. It's great to see your names at the very least. <laughs>